Hello, BookTube, and welcome to another Middlemarch meditation. If you have been following along using the same Oxford Classics 2003 paperback edition that I've been reading, you'll know we left off the last video in the middle of page 55, with Mr. Brooke at the point where he was going to give bad news to Mrs. Cadwallader. It seemed a good idea to me today that we really should get to the end of the same chapter, chapter six, but it means we're going to have to get right to it because we've got seven pages to cover. Now, I think it's doable. And a lot of what happens in the rest of chapter six has been foreshadowed. So I'm going to summarize any parts or skim read where it feels like we're just going over old ground, you know, not saying anything new. Okay, so here we are on page 55, and we're, we're looking at the point just under the blue line there, which is Mr. Brooke speaking. He says, I hope Chetham and I will always be good friends, but I am sorry to say there is no prospect of his marrying my niece. And then this wonderful phrase, much relieved to see through the window that Celia was coming in. Hence the title of today's meditation, Celia coming in. <laughs> just in the nick of time. Because, of course, Mrs. Cadwallader says, and I should have underlined the cutting words again, because she says with a sharp note of surprise, why not? Uh, and, and says that it was only two weeks ago that they were talking about this. And uh, Mr. Brooke, of course, goes on to say, you know, my niece has chosen another suitor, has chosen him, you know. I have had nothing to do with it. Well, that's true. <laughs> Well, or, or maybe it isn't. Maybe it isn't. I still do wonder why he brought Mr. Casalvin to dinner. Uh, he was either, as you know, just meant to occupy a place at the table, or Mr. Brook was hedging his bets. I don't know. Or pleasing Casalvin. If Casalvin and Mr. Brook are doing some kind of political thing together, which of course is what Mrs. Cadwallader is utterly convinced of, then maybe he, yeah, I don't know. We're going to leave it there. It's very, very open, and maybe later in the book I'll become more convinced one way or another. Uh, he said, I should have preferred Chetham. And I should have said Chetham was the man any girl would have chosen. But there is no accounting for these things. And then he ends the paragraph by saying, your sex is capricious, you know. Mr. Brooke, is, he's holding his only line of defense here. You, you have to sympathize with his point of view on that regard. The only weapon he has against Mrs. Cadwallader. She claims to be a, a defender of the way things ought to be, yeah, the conservative status quo upholder. Well, then he's just fighting fire with fire. He's, he's relieved that Celia has arrived because she's going to give him a very conventional get out. Celia's arrival will mean that Mrs. Cadwallader now has female company, right? And so naturally the men would tend to withdraw and let them get on with it. But there's also a suggestion that there might exist between Celia and Mrs. Cadwallader, a certain mutual regard. So we see that uh, Celia, it says, I'm going down to the bottom of the page now, it says, but here Celia entered, blooming from a walk in the garden, lovely. So in other words, looking, looking very lovely. And the greeting with her delivered Mr. Brooke from the necessity of answering immediately. So Mr. Brooke didn't actually have to give the bad news himself, even better, even better. He got up hastily and saying, by the way, I must speak to Wright about the horses. So Wright is a servant or somebody, but at any rate, he shuffled quickly out of the room. But of course, he knows nothing will stop Mrs. Cadwallader. So she immediately wants to know. She says, my dear child, what is this? This about your sister's engagement, said Mrs. Cadwallader. Celia, in her usual, plain, no frills, you get the honest truth, simply says she is engaged to marry Mr. Casalban, said Celia, resorting as usual to the simplest statement of fact. And here's the phrase that I, th I think we should latch onto, and enjoying this opportunity of speaking to the rector's wife alone. And you'll recall that previously, Celia happened to know about some gossip that came via Mrs. Cadwallader's maid, and Dorothea scolded her for paying attention to gossip. But here we come back to a point that we made in the previous video about Mrs. Cadwallader representing a, a social function, and that function is gossip. And I never really thought of gossip that way before. You know, we, we do look down on it. It's got it's got a bad rep, and yet it, it happens. It's a human thing that happens. And uh, And both monitoring gossip and managing gossip can sometimes be key to creating a, a dynamic within a group. And to be fair, Celia obviously has something of a flair for this. Maybe she's got a greater talent than Mrs. 
Cadwallader. Because Celia, you know, when she wants to persuade or she wants to bring up a difficult point, we already have seen that she can do it quite subtly. She can catch the person that she's speaking to by surprise. And maybe the reason Celia enjoys Mrs. Cadwallader's company is because she aspires consciously or possibly unconsciously. To, to help maintain the social norms in Middlemarch and, and recognizes the rector's wife as something of an authority on how this is done. Now, having said all that, we're going to skip most of the conversation. Now, when I put page 56 up, we're not really going to go through that conversation between the two of them in detail because Celia is basically telling Mrs. Cadwallader what we already know about Dorothea's engagement. And we're pretty certain, aren't we, that Mrs. Cadwallader isn't going to be pleased. So I'm just going to pause now to put up the next page for you, and then we'll carry on reading. Okay, so you can see I've put up page 56, but I've pulled the image right down, so we're looking at the last paragraph of that page. Because Celia tells Mrs. Cadwallader, yeah, Dorothy's engaged in Mr. Salvin. Mrs. Cadwallader goes, what, what, whatever for? You know, why not Mr. Chetham? Didn't you think Mr. Chetham was nice? And, and of course, Celia says, yes, I thought he was a lovely gentleman. And, and, uh, and, and then also Celia tries, in the way that she always does, to defend Dorothy in the sense of, I mean, she doesn't say Dorothy is a wonderful woman. She just says, you know, Dorothy is a little bit funny in the way she sees things, and you, you, you mustn't be angry with her, etc. So we come down. And this final paragraph, Mrs. Cadwallader is sort of concluding the interview, so to speak. And she says, well, putting on her shawl and rising as if in haste, I must go straight to Sir James and break this to him. He will have brought back his mother by this time, and I must call. Your uncle will never tell him. We are all disappointed, my dear. That and so Celia gets the clear message, bad choice. Young people should think of their families in marrying. I set a bad example. Well, I find that interesting <laughs> that this woman who represents almost the, the, the policeman, the social policeman of Middlemarch didn't particularly do too well herself. And it'd be interesting if we could have a story about the young Mrs. Cadwallader before she was a missus. And I'd be interested to know what made her make up her mind. Because, of course, unless she had no other suitors, unless uh, the rector was really the only man who came forward to claim her hand in marriage. Uh, and, and I thought, well, given that the family she comes from, I might have thought she'd have a few more options. But I would have loved to have heard her story. What made her make the choice she did? But she doesn't tell us. She just says she married a poor clergyman, okay, and made myself a pitiable object among the de Bracys, her relations, obliged to get my coals by stratagem and pray to heaven for my salad oil, meaning, you know, all these little things I want, you know, it wasn't so easy to have all the uh, little, well, necessities, if you talk about coal, but uh, salad oil, I, <laughs> she goes from one thing to another. Uh, however, Casalban has money enough, okay? I must do him that justice. So in other words, what she's saying of Dorothea, it was a disappointing choice, but at least, at least you weren't really stupid like me and couldn't even manage to find somebody with money. As to his blood, Mrs. Cadwallader says. Now, this is a lovely phrase, which I've got to explain. I suppose the family quarterings are three cuttlefish sable and a commentator rampant. That needs a little bit of explaining. I'm going to post a link in my description box to a very straightforward and short video, which will explain what quarterings mean in heraldic terms. So in a way, this is a, this is a joke. It could be a joke. His, his, his crest consists of three ink black cuttlefish, three cuttlefish sable, and, and they're a source of ink. Cuttlefish are a source of ink. And the commentator rampant, well, of course, rampant, rampant applied to, they apply to the animals you often see on the sides of a heraldic crest, which are always standing sideways. I, I can't sort of imitate, but you know, the, if you think of the lion on the English, the rampant means they're standing on their hind legs and they're lifting their front limbs as well. And that's rampant, a rampant um, stance. I guess you would call it. And commentator, though, that's, there's no animal called a commentator. I think she simply means that she's referring to commentators as in biblical scholastic commentators and referring, of course, to Casalban's fixation with religious scholarship. In other words, so she's kind of making up a, a herald, a, a family crest for him and says it's made out of, you know, the animals that make ink and then a bunch of commentators standing on either side. And and that's what I mean, that, that maybe she doubts his lineage will continue. And, and because that was part of the reason for having those family crests, those crests would change each time. Uh, and you'll see this in the video. If a daughter were to marry the son of another family, the family crest that their children would inherit would look slightly different than the crests 
of the two parents. It would reflect all that, all the lineage of the families that they came from. And so maybe she's doubting that Casalvin will ever manage to have a family that he can pass a crest down to. So she's just making fun. And that's it for page 56. I'm going to put up page 57 now. Okay, page 57. And we have now another example of Mrs. Cadwallader's miserly inclinations. Let's read what she goes on to say. By the by, before I go, my dear, I must speak to your Mrs. Carter about pastry. I want to send my young cook to learn of her. Poor people with four children, you know, like us, you know, can't afford to keep a good cook. I have no doubt Mrs. Carter will oblige me. Sir James Cook is a perfect dragon. What Mrs. Cadwallader must be trying to do is to apprentice some young person in her household, I, I don't know who, to get some, and then get somebody else's experienced cook to train them so she doesn't have to hire an experienced servant because cooks commanded, uh, relatively speaking, a cook commanded better wages than many other household servants. So she's looking for a cheap way to get herself a trained cook. And when she says Sir James Cook is a perfect dragon, I think what she means is Sir James Cook spoke very frankly about what she thought of Mrs. Cadwallader's scheme for getting a cook on the cheap. Paragraph goes on to say the next one, doesn't it? In less than an hour, Mrs. Cadwallader had circumvented Mrs. Carter. And that was such a weird verb. I thought, what on earth <laughs> happened there? Because I thought, I, I know I know a couple of meanings of circumvented, but I, I don't know that I would, it sounded as though had had avoided her. And I thought, well, I, I didn't think she wanted to do that. I think she wanted to see her. So I, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to go... Um, back to the dictionary definitions and just say, so circumvent, three meanings. One, find a way round and in brackets, an obstacle. Now that's what I thought. When you when, when they put an obstacle in brackets in the definition, I thought, oh, okay. So in other words, Mrs. Carter might herself have been a bit of an obstacle to Mrs. Cadwallader's plans, but somehow Mrs. Cadwallader managed to find a way round that obstacle. Or it says, second definition, overcome a problem or difficulty, typically in a clever and surreptitious way. Well, there we go. I don't know if Mrs. Cadwallader is particularly surreptitious. Uh, she's very per, um, persistent. That's the word I want. And determined. And she knows, you know, she knows her family lineage. And sometimes you can, you could, people like that can just, they just assume they're going to get their way eventually. I say that like I know so many. Well, I've known a few. <laughs> I've known a few and, and perhaps I haven't met the exceptions yet. Okay, let's put it that way. Let's put it that way. Uh, and then, of course, there's also an archaic meaning, and they don't give a date here, but circumvent means to deceive or to outwit. Okay, so if that meaning was used or was understood in the 19th, the early 19th century, then you could say Mrs. Cadwallader outwitted Mrs. Carter and got what she wanted, got training for her poor, inexperienced girl who was, to be fair, I feel sorry for the girl. She's not going to have a good time of it. She's going to get a resentful teacher. Move down the page just a little bit here. So you can move it down, move it down, move it down. Mrs. Cadwallader arrives at Sir James Chetham's and he's just about to come out. And we begin from Mrs. Cadwallader's statement. She says, when they are together in the conservatory pretending to look at plants, she says to him, I have a great shock for you. I hope you are not so far gone in love as you pretended to be. And it does... <laughs> it, it does upset Sir James just a little. His countenance changed a little. He felt a vague alarm. The interesting thing is that Mrs. Cadwallader doesn't go straight into the business of Dorothea and Casalvin. She leaves that out. She starts with the uncertainty she has about what Mr. Brooke is going to do politically. I do believe Brooke is going to expose himself. After all, I accused him of meaning to stand for Middlemarch on the liberal side, and he looked silly and never denied it, talked about the independent line and the usual nonsense. Having given that to him, now maybe that's deliberate because of course, Sir James is, he's taken off guard because I think he's probably expecting to hear something about Dorothea. And so when he doesn't, he, he, he just hears about the politics. And of course he may know more about that than Mrs. Cadwallader does because there are probably things she doesn't get to hear because they're not spoken of in the company of women. So he, he just says, is that all? And he's much relieved because he thinks, oh, you know, if you're just worried about Brooke's politics, I, I you know, I'm not that worried about that. <laughs> and Mrs. Cadwallader, of course, she rejoins with a, a sharper note. So there we go. Another cut word. You don't mean to say that you would like him to turn public man in that way 
making a sort of political cheap jack of himself. Cheap jack, it was a slang term at the time for a huckster, or charlatan, somebody traveling around selling goods of dubious reliability, value, <laughs> efficacy. You know, pick any of those words that apply. So James Chetham, he, he is, still isn't worried. He said uh, he, that is Mr. Brooke, might be dissuaded, I should think. He would not like the expense. So there's obviously some expense involved in trying for political office, as you might expect. Mrs. Cadwallader said, that is what I told him. He is vulnerable to reason there. Always a few grains of common sense in an ounce of miserliness. <laughs> Mrs. Cadwallader should well know, yeah. Miserliness, she says, is a capital quality to run in families. It's the safe side of madness. I just, oh, when I said it's the safe side for madness to dip on, I, that's that's what I thought was always. I think it's interesting that she considers it a kind of madness, but, but the safe kind. But then she goes on, and this phrase I underlined, and there must be a little crack in the Brooke family, that is, you know, a little a little uh, fissure. There's something unstable in that family or, or we wouldn't have, she said, else we should not see what we are to see. So she's still dropping hints, I haven't told you everything. <laughs> and I don't know if she's leaving it to cushion the shock or to make the shock worse. Because the longer she makes Sir James stand there wondering what is going on, the more she's agitating him. And maybe she's doing this to, I'm trying to decide, to destabilize him, to make him vulnerable and open to suggestion. And I say that because of what happens on the next page, which I'm going to load up right now. Now we're going to skim this. As I said, we're not going to talk too much about the conversation that now happens on this page because we know what's coming. Mrs. Cadwallader says, I always told you Miss Brooke would be such a fine match. I knew there was a great deal of nonsense in her, a flighty sort of methodistical stuff. I thought, okay. I never think of Methodists as being that radical, but I, I think they were a little more radical in, in their day, in the 1830s when the movement began. But these things wear out of girls. However, I am taken by surprise for once. What do you mean, Mrs. Cadwallader said Sir James? His fear, and here's his fear, or so the narrator says, his fear lest Miss Brooke should have run away to join the Moravian Brethren. And I, I had to look them up. They were a, they were a Central European Protestant sect. In fact, they were considered probably the earliest Protestants, but they didn't get to the same, I don't know, notoriety as Martin Luther and Calvin and other groups. Uh, but I found it a bit strange. I thought, how, you know, you can see me writing just at the end of the paragraph there. Would Sir James be likely to know an obscure Central European sect? I mean, he's a man that does read but what we know that he reads so far is, of course, books on agricultural science. And that makes sense. He's a landowner. But I feel like he's a man, he's a man of his land. He rides, he has dogs, horses, etc. I just don't think, see him being a, an in-depth reader like Mr. Brooke is. I sat and I thought, well, unless he, he takes sort of a, one of those lovely magazines, uh, Roy Reads Anything, uh, is, he's reading some of these at the moment. General magazines that went out, you could get so many different kinds in the 19th century. And they would give you little snippets and stories of different things. And I could I could imagine, because they tended to be very casual, light reading, something that you could read aloud in the evenings while the ladies did embroidery, and, and there would be, wouldn't be anything, you know, untoward in them. Perhaps Sir James might take a subscription to something like that. Perhaps. Maybe he might have heard of these Moravian brethren, because maybe it might have been a little curious article. But I... I was skeptical. I actually felt that if I was an editor, and okay, I would I would have to be unbelievably conceited to think that I would be the kind of editor that could actually point something out to George Eliot that she would need to correct. But I, I think conversationally, I might suggest, or at least start the conversation as to whether this thought that Miss Brooke should have run away to join the Moravian Brethren, whether that really reflected Sir James Chetham's does it make sense for his character to have those thoughts? Or is that really a reflection of George Eliot's? Uh, but that, that's what I feel. I feel that this is one of those moments, and it's very slight. So, you know, you could read right over this and, and not really care. But we are doing, of course, a deep, careful reading. So I'm stopping here to say, hmm, these are one of those moments where I feel like the author shows through. So I imagine she knew a great deal about the Moravian Brethren, but I'm less convinced that Sir James Chetham did. Mrs. Cadwallader, she uh, she remains perfectly in character. She tells Sir James finally what he wants to know, which is that uh, Dorothea is engaged to 
Casalban. And it's so shocking that Sir James, who had been sort of, you know, sort of whacking his boot with the whip that he's holding, lets it fall and has to pick it up. And perhaps his face had never before gathered so much concentrated disgust as when he turned to Mrs. Cadwallader and repeated, Casalban. And then he goes on and, and he compares Casalban to a mummy. Uh, the point of view has to be allowed for as that of, now this is cool, of a blooming and disappointed rival. That's the word blooming appearing twice in this chapter. Once to describe Celia, now to describe Sir James Chetham himself, which is interesting because it's just, it's very subtle, but it's, it's, it's linking the two of them. They're both blooming people at the prime of their lives. Mrs. Cadwallader quoting Dorothea, he, Casalban, is a great soul. And then she says, a great bladder for dried peas to rattle in. And that's that's brilliant. Uh, and I should explain, that's that's not her just making up a load of stuff. It used to be in the early 19th century that children, agricultural communities, children would be given animal bladders. I know, you're thinking, what? From from animals that had been slaughtered for food. And they would they would the bladder would be inflated and left to dry naturally. And so it would it would oh, what would it look like? I can't like a like a paper almost like a paper lantern. That, that fragile and that sort of round. And then it would be filled with dried peas or some other thing. And often would children use them as rattles and noisemakers. The other point, though, about them is that they were very fragile toys, which is, which is interesting. So it suggests two things. This is, a, this is an insult that makes two points. One, it makes the point, Casalbin is just Dorothea's little toy. This is just, this is just a phase. This is a silly thing that she's doing. This is not a real marriage. This doesn't count. Secondly, the fragility of those dried bladders, what she's also implying is, you know, that's a husband that hasn't got long for this world. Of course, what do they talk about but his, but his age? What business has an old bachelor like that to marry, said Sir James? He has one foot in the grave, to which Mrs. Cadwallader says, he means to draw it out again, I suppose. And I can understand how a man like Sir James Chetham, so hale and hearty, is wondering how could he possibly have lost out in any courtship contest to a man like Casalban. Anyway, we're going to go on now to the top of page 59. Page 59. And right at the top, we start reading here where Mrs. Cadwallader says to Sir James, come, come, cheer up. You are well rid of Miss Brooke, a girl who would have been requiring you to see the stars by daylight. Between ourselves, little Celia is worth two of her, okay, and likely, after all, to be the better match. For this marriage to Casalban is as good as going to a nunnery. So again, another another hint that there won't be, you know, there won't be children from this marriage. It won't last very long, on and on. But I think it's interesting because we're, we're starting now to plant a seed. Mrs. Cadwallader has prepared the ground so well. She's destabilized Sir James Chetham, she could probably tell that he's quite, well, she doesn't have to tell. He, his own expressions show how upset he is that the Casalban of all people has managed to get Dorothea's hand and he has not. But Mrs. Cadwallader is getting in there right away now and she's already beginning to plant seeds. Although this chapter will deny that's what's going on, but it will deny it in, a, in an ironic way. Sir James keeps going on. He says, oh, on, on my own account, it is for Miss Brooke's sake. I think her friends should try to use their influence. And Mrs. Cadwallader dissuades him. She says, you're not going to get that from my husband. There isn't anybody. And then she starts again. She said, I should prefer Celia, especially when Dorothea was gone. The truth is, you have been courting one and have won the other. Oh, now, Mrs. Cadwallader doesn't honestly know that. But, but she's taking a, a gamble, and it's probably a safer gamble than the one she took with Dorothea. So I can see that she admires you almost as much as a man expects to be admired. If it were anyone but me who said so, you might think it an exaggeration. Goodbye. So she's off. That's all she does. She just plants some seeds. Now, Sir James is not quite ready to, she's planted them, but they take a little while to sprout because you can see that Sir James, his first reaction is to get on his horse. However, because of his friend's unpleasant news, he was going to ride the faster in some other direction than that of Tipton Grange. So in other words, he was going to go to Tipton Grange. Now he's like, just a minute, I need some time. It's this paragraph that I think is delicious. I'm going to read through it, just spend a little bit more time on it. Now, why on earth should Mrs. Cadwallader have been at all busy about Miss Brooke's marriage? And why, when one match that she liked to think she had a hand in 
was frustrated. Should she have straight away contrived the preliminaries of another? Was there any ingenious plot, any hide-and-seek course of action which might be detected by a careful telescopic watch? Let's look for scientific words here now, or optics-related words. So it's saying, you know, can we perceive anything beneath all these little hints that she's dropping? Uh, of course, the narrator says, oh, no, yeah, not at all. A telescope might have swept the parishes of Tipton and Freshet, the whole area visited by Mrs. Cadwallader in her phaeton, without witnessing any interview that could excite suspicion or any scene from which she did not return with the same unperturbed keenness of eye and the same high natural color. In other words, she'd be just as red-cheeked as I am a bit today. Yeah, <laughs> red-cheeked uh, as, as always. In fact, if that convenient vehicle, the phaeton, if the pony phaeton had existed in the days of the seven sages stop there i am not a classics graduate as you now know because i had to look these guys up but they were a group of greek intellectuals who lived during the sixth and seventh centuries bc and they were pioneers in philosophy and politics i had not heard of any of their names but Eliot wagers that for all their combined wisdom, they would not have been able to discern a purpose uh, to Mrs. Cadwallader's visits. It says that even if this convenient vehicle had existed in the days of the seven sages, one of them would doubtless have remarked that you can know little of women by following them about in their pony phaetons. And then she says, then she makes an interesting scientific comparison. Even with a microscope, directed on a water drop. We find ourselves making interpretations which turn out to be rather coarse. For whereas under a weak lens, now bear in mind how often we have talked about sight being a theme throughout Middlemarch, seeing, being able to see, being short-sighted, being blind, Celia's name meaning blind, and yet she has a certain sight, and Dorothea also has a certain sight, but they're different kinds of sight. So let's go back to that. So even with a microscope directed on a water drop, we find ourselves making interpretations which turn out to be rather coarse. For whereas, under a weak lens, you may seem to see a creature exhibiting an active voracity into which other smaller creatures actively play as if they were so many, bear with me while I pull up page 60, so many animated tax pennies. Lovely, lovely little comparison. So she's saying, yeah, you'll see something if you look under a microscope at a weak lens. It'll look like some activity, but you won't be able to interpret it correctly. Then she says, a stronger lens, right, a different sight, reveals to you certain tiniest hairlets. So she's talking about the cilia. So she's comparing all this social activity to um, paramecium. She's comparing Mrs. Cadwallader to a paramecium. I think, wow. <laughs> there are insults, and then there's what George Eliot could do. So she says, a stronger lens reveals to you certain tiniest hairlets which make vortices for these victims while the swallower waits passively at his receipt of custom. In this way, metaphorically speaking, a strong lens applied to Mrs. Cadwallader's matchmaking will show a play of minute causes producing what may be called thought and speech vortices oh, to bring her the sort of food she needed wow i just i just marvel at that uh at comparing that social function showing that mrs cadwallader is in fact hunting she's doing her own kind of hunting creating minute causes and so so doing so almost little ambushes she can't aggressively openly hunt so she has to do things in in a much more interesting way drawing things toward her making currents starting currents that will inevitably pull toward her what she needs i just that's just a fantastic lengthy allegory and metaphor for mrs cadwallader's social function and again i just keep thinking she's elliot is looking so closely at what is it that makes human societies work, uh, for better or worse. But I think we're meant to to recognize that within groups of human beings, this, this kind of thing goes on and is perhaps as much natural, I put that in inverted commas, as the behavior of paramecium under a microscope. And then it uh, goes on to talk about uh, Mrs. Cadwallader and, and explaining how, how simple she was. Her life was rurally simple, quite free from secrets, either foul, dangerous, or otherwise important. In other words, the things Mrs. Cadwallader knows, neither here nor there. And she, that is, not consciously affected by the great affairs of the world. And then Elliot does this amazing thing where she just uses the same words and says, 
all the more did the affairs of the great world interest her. So in other words, saying she's not interested in current events, the things happening in England and beyond England, the things that will move the world wherever they're happening, nah, they're lost on Mrs. Cadwallader. But what is never lost is the affairs of the great, which in her mind is all these English aristocrats, the great families, the pedigree families of England. That to her, what they do. And so and then it goes on to give, you know, funny examples in which fascinating younger sons had gone to the dogs by marrying their mistresses, the fine old blooded idiocy of young Lord to peer and the furious gouty humors of old Lord uh, Megatherium. That's an interesting name. I need to, I didn't look up in the notes. I didn't look at note 39. So I'm not sure what she's, what she's referring to there with Megatherium. I'm sorry about that. Normally really fastidious about looking up all the notes for you. But the exact crossing of genealogies which had brought a coronet into a new branch and widened the relations of scandal, these were topics of which she retained details with the utmost accuracy and reproduced them in an excellent pickle of epigrams, at which she herself enjoyed the more because she believed as unquestioningly in birth and no birth as she did in game and vermin. Brilliant. What matters is the pedigree of a few families in one country in the whole world. And as far as she's concerned, that is the world. And she's not alone. You know who she reminds me of a lot is, let me pull up another slide here. And what you're looking at here is the very first page of Jane Austen's Persuasion. And forgive, please, all the notations and markings on this copy. I had to do an open university assignment, so I was writing all over this. But this is, this I think is, in truth, my favorite Jane Austen so far. I've only read three, okay? So I need to read the others and tell you if, if one, somebody, you know, gets better. But persuasion, I love persuasion. But it opens with Sir Walter Elliot, of all things, another Elliot. Sir Walter Elliot of Kellynch Hall in Somersetshire was a man who, for his own amusement, never took up any book any book but the Baronetage, in other words, de Brett's. And there he found occupation for an idle hour and consolation in a distressed one. There his faculties were roused into admiration and respect by contemplating the limited remnant of the earliest patent. There any unwelcome sensations arising from domestic affairs changed naturally into pity and contempt as he turned over the almost endless creations of the last century. Now, so what is being said here is, yeah, Sir Walter Elliot, who has his own page, as you can see in Debrett's, you can see that quoted right down at the bottom of the picture there. But what, what drives Sir Walter Elliot insane is he opens Debrett's and he can see just the remnants of older titled families. And what does he see that drives him absolutely insane? All these new people, these new people who do not, who have no blood for him and for Mrs. Cadwallader, I don't know where they get this concept of blood because at the end of the day, your ancestor was at one time or another not important. However, they must have done a favor for someone who was important or they stole something. And then suddenly you become a wealthy title person. And then if you have enough generations go by, nobody remembers how you originally got all your wealth and power and you become blood. So I'm going to take that picture down now. What Elliot is describing is not, she's not fanciful in making up Mrs. Cadwallader because the very fact that Austen creates a very similar character with a very similar bent of mind. And if you read Persuasion, the whole book is about Sir Walter Elliot's obsession with what he sees as his natural place in, in the social order, which he doesn't think should change. So we'll go back now. Let me take Persuasion off here. I'll put back up page 60. So that's what this, the rest of page 60 is saying, is, is that this is Mrs. Cadwallader. It says, how could Mrs. Cadwallader feel that the Miss Brooks and their matrimonial prospects were alien to her? In other words, everybody who was important, their marriages and what they did and what children they had, yeah, it all mattered to her because it was the only thing that mattered to her and the only thing that she believed mattered. Okay, page 61. From the first arrival of the young ladies in Tipton, she, that is Mrs. Cadwallader, had pre-arranged Dorothea's marriage with Sir James. This is an interesting fact. Literally from the time those girls finished their schooling in Switzerland and came back to England to live with Mr. Brooke, from that moment, Mrs. Cadwallader made it some kind of personal mission to look out for marriages for them. And if it had taken place would have, that is, if, if Dorothea had married Sir James, and, and if it had taken place, would have been quite sure that it was her doing. She deliberately sets out to make these things happen. 
had, and it caused her an irritation, which every thinker will sympathize with. Uh, she was the diplomatist of Tipton and Freshett, and for anything to happen in spite of her was an offensive irregularity. It, in other words, it showed that Dorothea did not recognize who Mrs. Cadwallader really was. To just go and make some other decision when it was quite clear what was being set up for her. As to freaks, oh, that, now that's a scary word, but it just it shows how skewed this can get. As to freaks like this of Miss Brooks, Mrs. Cadwallader had no patience with them and now saw that her opinion of this girl had been infected with some of her husband's weak charitableness. I may need to comment on this further because it's an interesting contrast between Christianity as the, the, the aspects of Christianity that I think people don't have any difficulty with. Nobody has any trouble with the idea of mercy and forgiveness and grace and those concepts. But it's interesting that for Mrs. Cadwallader, those are weaknesses. You can make a version of Christianity where you, like Mrs. Cadwallader, just, you just dismiss all that nice stuff. That's weak. The difficulty is that, you know, which is stronger, hate or love? In, in an ultimate sense, right? Take it outside of religion. Which is stronger? I think that's a good question to be asked. Hate is difficult to kill off. It's so much easier, I think. It's, it's, it's lazier. You, you can hate because you don't have to get to know or think about things, right? That's, hatred is, is that easy. But love, love means you have to get to know stuff. <laughs> really no way around it. We're going to skip on now because basically Mrs. Cadwallader says to her husband later on, I throw, I throw her over, that is Dorothea, I give up on her. And, uh, but she'd obviously done her bit. She, she dropped, she said, Miss, Miss Brooke, there could not have been a more skillful move toward the success of her plan than her hint to the baronet that he had made an impression on Celia's heart. And so as we go, I'm not, I'm not going to go on about anything that, that Sir James does here. It's, by the time we get to page 62, what is clear is, is that he eventually runs off steam. You know, he, he's, he says, thus it happened that after Sir James had ridden rather fast for half an hour in a direction away from Tipton Grange, in other words, we had to work off a little bit of, of bad feeling, he slackened his pace and at last turned into a road which would lead him back, that is to Tipton, by a shorter cut. He, he, he went back to visit Tipton Grange after all. And, and he says he's going he's gonna to use the opportunity now. He can congratulate Dorothea on her engagement. He can talk to her a little bit about the cottages, but now he knows marriage is off the cards. And now what he's going to do is it says um, there certainly was present in him the sense that Celia would be there and that he should pay her more attention than he had done before. So seed planted, sprouted, growing. I love this last paragraph that ends the chapter. We mortals men and women, devour many a disappointment between breakfast and dinner time. Keep back the tears and look a little pale about the lips and in answer to inquiries say, oh, nothing. And then Eliot concludes, or the narrator concludes, I do not know, <laughs> maybe both. Pride helps us, interesting view. And pride is not a bad thing when it only urges us to hide our own hurts, not to hurt others. Now, I don't know if she's making a contrast there between Mrs. Cadwallader, who I think would quite happily hurt somebody <laughs> out of pride, and maybe Sir James Chetham, who, yes, is a proud man, but not a man that would hurt someone with his pride. I'll close on that note. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Bye-bye.